All right. Well, I hope everyone's getting excited to hear from our partner Salesforce Ventures on how our entrepreneurs can navigate investments for their solutions. We're going to be hearing from Enki Toto. She's an investor and senior manager with Salesforce Ventures, and she's going to be helping us learn more about the basics of investing and how a corporate VC is different, how to prepare for your pitch, and more, followed by a Q&A with her. So Enki, is a, she's an investor for the Salesforce Ventures Impact Fund. It's a corporate venture capital fund that invests in cloud technology solutions, including education and workforce development, sustainability, DE&I, and the social sector. She's been involved in the company's investments with Block Power, Circular, Krahana, Elvest, and Propel. So welcome, Enki. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Erin. Thanks for thanks for having me, and and thanks to everyone that's that's joining the call. Um, it's great to to be able to to speak you, to you all, and um, again, thanks for joining and, and listening to to what we have to share today. So happy, Erin, to to kind of run through the the presentation now, if that's if that's helpful. Oh yes, please, absolutely. Um, so. You know, just a, a bit of background maybe on, on our fund. So I'm one of the investors on the, as Aaron mentioned, on the Salesforce Ventures Impact Fund. So our our team is is really focused on investing similar to Salesforce Ventures and enterprise software companies, but we're particularly looking at companies that have a social and environmental mission. And so for us, you know, we, we look at financial returns and want those market rate financial returns, but we also dive really deep into into impact and, and look at, you know, how are, what's the impact that the companies are having? Um, how many students are they serving? What are the types of, you know, communities that the students that they're serving are coming from? What are, are they expanding financial access to, to those that are previously underbanked or unbanked? Um, you know, are they, are they able to make, make substantial um, strides towards climate action, et cetera? So we're, like I said, we're really looking for that impact. And then in terms of the type of investor that we are, and I think this will make sense as we go through the presentation, but we're typically a follow-on investor. Um, and we, you know, our check size is anywhere from 2 million to 10 million, but but we really are that follow-on investor, which as I said, will make sense as we as we go along this presentation. Um, so maybe next slide, thank you. So just a, an overview of what I wanted to, to cover today is, you know, one, different types of funding. There's so many sources of funding out there. And I believe really strongly in finding the right type of funding for your business and, and for your goals. And then we'll do, because I am a venture investor, um, do kind of a, an overview of what actually is venture capital. It's it's definitely been a hot hot topic in, in the last two years as funding has, has grown and grown and, and more capital has been allocated to venture. Um, but I think it'd be helpful to kind of go through the nuts and bolts of venture. And then lastly, we'd love to cover some pitching tips. You know, we, we see so many companies on a, a weekly and annual basis. And so just pulling together some tips on what we like to see on, in a pitch deck and, and what I want to make sure that you all are well equipped to include in your pitch deck, as well as, you know, nuts and bolts on, on financials and, and different KPIs that investors are likely to ask. And I'll apologize in advance for my my sound and my throat. I'm, I'm still recovering from a little bit of an illness, so um, might have to sneeze once or twice here. But apologies in advance. All right. So if we go to the next slide, yeah. So this is you know this as I mentioned, there's so many different types of funding, and it is really really critical to make sure that your goals on how you want to grow your business and what your goals for the company are and your milestones that you want to reach and three, four, five, 10 years look like, um, and then attaching those goals to the right type of capital. And so and think about capital, there's, and think about the life cycle of a company, there's sort of the early stage. So you have the idea, you're pulling together those first few customers, um, you're still building out exactly what the product is and how it aligns with, with your customers and what exactly they're looking for. And in this case, you know, typically you'll look for either debt investor. So you could take out a, a traditional loan, um, similar to, you know, working with your, your local banks. Um, there's certain funders out there that are specifically focused on small businesses. And actually we are talking about startups. So there's actually a, a whole wealth of startups out there that are specifically tailored 
towards underwriting um, small businesses. And it doesn't necessarily have to be venture debt. So companies that are, are, are funding um, institutions that are investing in companies that then want to get venture debt, there's there are startups that are investing in um, any type of small business. And then equity is, is venture. And so we'll dive much deeper into equity. But then the other one is grants and, and safe. So grants is something interesting, particularly if you are investing in you're building a company that is impact related. Over the last couple of years, there have been so many different types of grant organizations that have popped up. And so I think that this is an interesting one to look at because it could give you that sort of bootstrap money that many founders can't necessarily ask their friends and family for. Um, so grants are a great way. And, and looking into the exact type of, you know, either philanthropic institutions that not only invest in nonprofit, but also are now starting to invest in for profit. Um, companies. I think those are really interesting. There's lots of government grants out there as well, um, specifically tailored to the SDGs. So I would definitely do your, your own desk research, because. but the, this is a, a new category of funding that is up and coming. And then, so these are types of capital, but sources of capital, you know, you'll, you'll see so many of these. I think Many, many investors, especially angel investors, and I have friends who started companies say to look at friends and family. I think while that's great, that's not necessarily an opportunity for, for everyone. Um, so I think those pitch competitions, crowdfunding, um, looking at different family offices and, and looking at, at incubators and accelerators, I think these are sort of other opportunities for you to gain funding outside of just, just bootstrapping or, or friends and family. Um, and then what we'll spend most of the time today is talk about venture. So if we look at, we can go to the next slides. Perfect. Um, so venture capital is a very unique type of funding. And I want to make one thing clear when we're looking at all these different types. I know that because venture has been so popular in the last couple of years, it, it, there's this connotation recently that it's, it's a cheaper type of funding. Um, and I would argue it's actually one of the most expensive types of funding you can get. So what do we mean by venture? Venture is taking a direct ownership into the company. So you are giving up your company ownership. You are now sharing it with investors and they are, yes, providing you capital upfront. And yes, there is no interest that you have to pay on that, on that capital on an annual basis, like you would on a debt loan. But ultimately when your company exits or, or um, you know, decides to, to sell, at that point, you do have to pay back your investors. And so your investors are the ones that have that preferred ownership in the company and typically are the ones that are getting liquidated first. So dive into that in a little bit more, but I just want to overview of exactly what is venture and how does that work. Um, so we go to the next slide. So when we think about venture, there's also different types of investors here. And as I mentioned before, I think, you know, while finding the type of capital that's appropriate for your business important, when you do decide to, to go after venture debt or venture um, capital, it's, it's important to know the type of investor that you are ultimately entering into a relationship with. So you have, these are just a couple types. There's, there's many others that will come up, but two that I want to talk about is institutional investors. So these are your typical kind of like tiger as an institutional investor. Um, you know, Salesforce Ventures actually is, is a corporate venture, but, but is starting to act more like an institutional investor. Um, we look at companies like, or funds like Bessemer, et cetera. So lots of these institutional, they're looking for market rate returns. They have um, investors and LPs in their own funds that they need to then return back to. So they have very strict timelines around when companies need to exit, when they need to have um, a return on their investment by, et cetera. And then corporate venture funds, these are typically the venture fund of an institute, of a company. So Salesforce is a good example of this. We started our venture fund back in 2009, and it was really with a strategic lens. So we started it to build out the Salesforce ecosystem. How do we invest in companies that are building on top of Salesforce or companies that ultimately could be additive to the Salesforce ecosystem? Um, and so there's lots of different types of corporate CV. CVCs, as they are called, you have ones ranging from, you know, Google Ventures, which is has no no strategic no strategic alliance to Google, right? While Google is their LP, they are not a they they act more like an institutional fund. 
And then you have Salesforce Ventures, which is which is in the middle. You know, we look at at more opportunistic strategic opportunities. So how do we partner with the companies down the line? But we're not necessarily, you know, we don't need to have an inked contract in place in order for us to make an investment. And then I'd say the the third bucket of corporate venture funds is ones where the only way that they'll invest in a company is if there is a contract. And sometimes entering into that pilot program or that contract is part of the diligence and is part of sort of the, the fundraising process in engaging with that type of CVC. Um, but it's a very different type of, of investor than, than say a, a more institutional type CVC. So as you're looking at corporate venture funds, I definitely, you know, as we say in interviews when we're hiring, sort of like it's your opportunity to interview the, the funds as well and learn about them and, and sort of what type of, what their goals are, what their values are, et cetera. Um, and then the fundraising process. So really it starts off with understanding how much, what type of capital you're looking for, but then also how much capital do you need? And then going out and talking to these investors. Fundraising can be a very lengthy, lengthy process. Um, it can be quick or it can take a long time. It, it sort of depends on every, every use case is different. The, it's based on sort of what's the timing in the market, how, how busy are investors at the moment? Who's, you know, are they going through their own fundraising, et cetera? So I would definitely recommend starting those conversations with investors and getting that, that list of, you know, wh who are the investors that I really want to talk to because their mandate matches to what I'm looking to build, right? I'm building the type of company they want to invest in. It, it ties into the sectors and industries that they are typically investing in. So I think these are the good investors for me to talk to. And then after that, it's, you know, starting to, to have those conversations and, and looking for that lead investor and looking for those additional investors to fill out the round. Um, and other things are, you know, figuring out what your valuation is. So part of that is, is a conversation with your lead investor, but having an idea of exactly how much you want to raise and at what price you're willing to, to take in this capital is, is also really important. Um, and then I think we we covered this, but some key pointers, you know, again, making sure venture is the right type of capital for you is is really critical to the entirety of the the venture life cycle. And when you do enter into that relationship with a with a venture investor, um, these are these are relationships that can last up to ten years or more. And so you really want to make sure that that you're building the right the right cap table there. If we move to the next slide. So I'm just going to cover a few slides on, on different types of investors and where they come in in the life cycle and, and what their value adds are. So as we mentioned, you know, you begin with, with an idea um, and you need that initial capital in order to pay yourself, pay your, pay your engineers, pay um, for the, you know, where, where you're building this, right? The rent, the, the maintenance, et cetera. All of these requires cash. And so angel investors are the ones that come in really early when there's an idea, right? Sort of that you have that pitch deck of here's what I want to build. I'm starting to build it, but now I need funding in order to really, and help in order to really build out my business. Um, and so angel investors are uniquely positioned to kind of, they get into the details, right? They work on, they work on, you know, what's your supply chain needs to be? What, what tech do you need to build? Let's connect you into the right tech founders and other founders that they have in their ecosystem. Let's connect you to the right talent. Um, they'll, they'll go into like helping you build, you know, a financial model and, and really working through the nuts and bolts of what does it take to build a company? Um, so angel investors are, are invaluable for, for really getting your, your company from zero to, to step two, right? Zero being you have an idea and getting to like that seed or series A phase, these, these investors are, are critical. And typically are also really critical in landing those initial early customers because angel investors have their own networks. And then once you're, once you're kind of <coughs> done with the angel investor round, that's when we move on to the next slide. That's when we move on to venture capital more broadly. And so these VC firms invest that, you'll hear these terms, but seed, series A, series B, series C, et cetera. So, at Seed and, and Series A, you typically have that product, you have that customer, right? Initial couple customers 
you know that product market fit. And now what you need cash for is scale. So how do we get more customers? How do we rapidly grow the company and rapidly um, become, you know, closer to that unicorn? And so that's where our VCs can be really helpful because they give that influx of capital. And then also they're uniquely positioned, you know, like I said, angel investors are really working on the nuts and bolts of building the company. Venture investors are really focused on, okay, you got the product. Now, how do we build out like a really good sales and marketing strategy, really good go-to-market strategy, building out your executive team to really fill it out. And so that's where, that's where venture investors will really push and, and start looking for is that scale and that, that rapid growth. And then the last part of the life cycle on the next slide is exit. So these are just two types of exits. There's lots of others, but one is acquisition. So acquisition can come from either a private equity fund buying up a majority, um, it can come from a strategic acquiring your company. You know, there's, it could be a merger between two startups together. So exit can, can look very differently for, for different companies, but exit is also what investors are looking for because they're looking to get that capital back. So when you're exiting, you're typically paying off your investors because someone else is now acquiring that, that ownership in the company. And then IPO is, you know, we've seen so many IPOs in the last year. I think it's been a, the hottest market for IPOs in, in many, many years. But IPO is the other one where instead of selling your, your ownership in the company to one third party, um, you're selling it to the public, right? You're, you're now public on the, on the stock exchange. So typically for an IPO, you're looking at, at a much bigger exit value. So at this point, expect it to be in the billion dollar plus category. And at that point, that's where companies start to think, you know, maybe my exit here is IPO versus versus an acquisition. All right. So that's sort of venture in a nutshell. Um, and then working through kind of the the advantages and, and disadvantages. I mean, you know, there's both right on on the advantages side you get capital and that's invaluable because when you're looking to build that company, when you're looking to hire that sales team and, and hire a, a team in general to, to support you, having that capital and, and a means to, to fund that hiring is really important. Um, you know, we've seen in, in recent times that having certain investors on your cap table is also a way to attract talent. So that's something we've definitely been hearing hearing from companies out there and, and individuals who are looking to, to go to a company. And then, you know, if investors are, they have an interesting perspective on the world. This is their, this is their day-to-day -day job, right? They're constantly looking at companies and are invested in many companies. And so through that, they see what's worked and what hasn't. Um, they can, they can kind of figure out red flags pretty quickly and help advise you on, you know, what they've seen in the past and how it's worked out and what the best path forward could be. So they do have that invaluable expertise. Um, they also have lots of connections. So lots of institutional funds have um, LPs who are directly invested in their funds. So those could be direct in, in initial customers. Um, they have their own portfolio that, that could be customers and, and also a community to, to relate to. So you build a lot of bonds with those with those other portfolio companies as well as potential introductions that you can get from your investors that could be invaluable customers. Um, and then you know they they have that industry. So there's lots of different types of of VCs. You want, one is a more generalist VC, so they'll invest in anything that that seems venture venture backable, um, where they're looking just for a large market and that big return. And otherwise, they're pretty agnostic into the types of companies that they invest in or you have a really industry specific venture investor. So Salesforce, for example, is really focused on enterprise software. We know that's where we are best positioned to work with companies and where we can offer the best advice and be the most valuable investor. And so that's why we're always looking at those enterprise software or FinTech companies. Um, other investors, particularly the ones that we work with on the impact fund are really focused on climate, for example. And so they have a deep expertise in climate tech and know a lot about how to, you know, how to build a great climate company. So that, I think that different type of experience, having a well-rounded cap table is also really important. So you get all those different types of, of experiences and, and expertise together 
and you have different, you know, different investors to lean on for, for different things. Um, and then, you know, your lead investor will typically have a board seat. So this is someone that will be in your quarterly meetings and, and really driving, driving some of the, the discussions and also the push as to where your company is going. So you get that expertise on a, on a quarterly basis, but you also have to realize that that's a relationship that, that will stay there for, for 10 plus years. And then on the negative side, um, as I mentioned before, you are giving up part of your company. So it's by no means free capital. You are, they are directly, you know, owning your company. Um, it can take a while to raise venture, venture money. So, you know, at the early stages, it can be a little bit quicker just because there's less diligence, but as time goes on, it can definitely take, take much longer. And then you really need to make sure that the, the house is, is sort of in order. So there'll be a, a lot of diligence, a lot of customer calls that, that investors will look for. There'll be, um, you know, financials that be required, KPIs that they'll review, et cetera. So lots of, lots of different things that you need to be prepared to, to provide to investors. All right. And then if we go to the next slide. So we talked a lot about what is venture, what are, you know, VCs typically offering and what's their, what's their value add, why you need a VC on your, in your company. Um, but one thing I did want to share is kind of what is this process? I know sometimes it can be kind of behind the, behind the curtain and, and it's not as publicly shared as like, what exactly is, is, v, what does it mean to get VC funding? What's that look like? Um, so, you know, this is, I think this is very typical for lots of, lots of investors, but for us, I know this is the case. It's, you know, we're typically having that initial meeting, maybe a follow-up meeting, um, kind of having those conversations and getting to know investors. It's that, that two-way interview of, of you, you researching them, them researching you, et cetera. And then once you're ready to start that investment process. So once you get a data room together, once you get all your financials together and all the materials, um, that's when investors will start doing their diligence. So they're going through, you know, your financials, they're going through your customers, they're looking at, at how well the company's done over time. They're, they're diving into the product roadmap. They may bring in experts to make sure that they really understand the technology that's being built, et cetera. So this becomes where you really open up the, the floodgates for questioning. And, and there's that, that much deeper review of, of the company that happens, um, and then typically investors, once they get all gather all that information, will pull together a pretty detailed investment memo. So this is what they present to their own investment committee. And that's a term you'll hear, hear often. The investment committee is essentially the, the team that's dedicated within the fund to, to make the decision of whether do we invest or not. And so at that investment committee, investors come in with the proposed amount they want to invest, um, the valuation metrics, who the other investors are that are around the table. And then also the reason behind, you know, all their findings that they've had on the company and the reason behind why they want to, why they want to invest. Sometimes, you know, the companies come in to present to investors during a, a partner meeting and, and an IC meeting. So that's something to be mindful of. So this whole process could take multiple, multiple rounds of, of discussions and multiple meetings and, and lots of back and forth via email. So that's why I say it. it's definitely not a, a quick process. And then after that investment committee meeting, it's typically a pass or you go into term sheet or if you're a follow on investor, you go into kind of confirming allocation. Um, and that's when when you start having these negotiations around, you know, what what are the terms? How do we how do we finalize this doing legal diligence, like opening up more and more contracts, et cetera. So and then after that, you get funding, um, which is great. And then you do a press release. So that's the typical process, I'd say. You know, it, it can change by fund. There's there's funds that can do the process in in a month. Um, there's funds that, or in two weeks. There's funds that that take a little bit longer because you know they they need that time. So it really there's no I'd say there's no clear cut timeline. Um, and there's also I don't think it's a I don't think there's anything negative around like the timing of what investors. It's really just you looking at you know who is the investor you want and then figuring out what the timing, the right timing between you two is. All right, so if we go to the next slide. Perfect. So I said before, there's different types of investors. Um, so 
I know I mentioned the lead investor, but this is really that anchor investor. So typically you want to get this lead investor first. They're the ones that set the terms um, of the deal. They're the ones that offer that, that term sheet, as I mentioned. And the term sheet is essentially a 10 page document that is a, a pared down version of the key terms that go into your financing docs. So this is where you discuss, you know, what's the pre-money valuation. And as I mentioned before, you really want to make sure that you're having that um, pre-money valuation, like in your head as like, how much do I, how much, how much do I want this company to be valued at? Um, and then investors will come in and, and they'll do their own calculations around that. And so there'll be some negotiation there. The round size is, you know, how much money do I need to raise? That's why it's important to make sure what you want to raise is in line with what your investors are thinking about as well. Um, and the closing timeline, liquidation preferences, typically this, this investor is also the biggest check in the round. That's why they're, um, that's why they're called the lead investor. So they take up a majority of the round. They, they usually get a, a seat on the board. And, and so this lead investor is really important. And then you have follow-on investors. Um, so follow-on investors are essentially filling out that round, right? So lead investor, let's say, and it depends how much they take, but if they take 50% of the round, right? You still have 50, another 50% to fill out. Some of this will be from existing investors and some of this will be from net new investors. And so these are new investors that don't necessarily write, you know, $10 million checks, but could write one to $2 million checks. And the reason to, to have these follow-on investors is, as I mentioned, lots of different types of VCs. You, you want to have this well-rounded um, well rounded round to have that different, to lean on that different expertise from lots of these different funds. So typically, you know, they, they also sign on to the term. So there's, they don't get as much pushback on what the valuation is, et cetera. And then strategic investors, these could be, these are typically corporate venture funds, um, but similar to follow on investors in check size and, and structure, but these could be where you get some really beneficial commercial arrangements or customer relationships from. Right. Next slide. Okay, so that was, I feel like we're, we're hopefully, hopefully going through this with enough time. Um, that was sort of the overview on venture and, and what we're looking for here. But I think just as important is ensuring that, that you all are, are well prepared for, for this type of, this type of, you know, pitching and, and conversation with, uh, with investors. Sorry, um, so I just wanted to share some, some pitch deck essentials. Um, if we can hit it again, because I think this slide has like some automation in it, perfect. So when you think about a pitch deck, the way I always like to talk about it with founders is it's your narrative on your company. So you want it to, you want it to be your, your it's your resume, right? This is, this is your, what you've been working so hard towards and the pitch deck is your, your opportunity to, to highlight that. And so it really needs that, you know, emotional pick me up. So how do I like, what's punchy about it? What's different? What's the problem here? Um, what's the market opportunity? Why are you uniquely positioned to, to solve this problem, right? And, and by you, I mean you as a founder, why are you the one that's building this amazing next company to solve this huge problem that we have? Um, and then the what? So definitely wanna be very clear on how your product directly solves that problem. I think having that be concise and pitchy and really, really streamlined is so important. Um, you think about like, what's your own elevator pitch for yourself? It's sort of what you want for your company is here's the problem and here's how we can solve it. And here's why we're different than everyone else and why we're uniquely positioned to solve this problem and how our product is better, has a moat, is, you know, rivals the competition, et cetera. And then the how is coming coming last. So you've already explained why, why you're building this company and what your product does. And this is how you're gonna scale it. So why are what's your go-to-market strategy, right? How are you, how are you building that that sales and marketing team? What are your unique, un, unique, your your unique approaches to scaling this business? Um, what does your business model look like? Investors will ask very often, kind of. What type of contracts are you entering into? What's the timing of those contracts? What's the recurring revenue versus the services revenue or implementation revenue? So 
having that business model really crisp is super important. And then where do you go from here? So how do you scale? What's the, what's your financial projections looking like? How do you get from, you know, a million in revenue this year to, to 3 million next year, 5 million in, in three years, et cetera. They want to see what your vision for where this, your company grows is. And then lastly, but, but not least obviously is team. So especially on the earlier side, investors are investing in the team because company is still early. And so the people that will take it forward to meet these projections that you just shared with them is that team. And so building a strong team and, and a team that, that can really show that execution that, that has a good um, background in, in building this type of company is really critical. So these are sort of what you want to make sure you have in your pitch deck. And then I want to spend a lot of time on, I think this is the, the hardest part is knowing what financials investors are looking for and what metrics and KPIs and I'll share that this is purely from a SaaS investor perspective, um, but many, many investors will also look for something similar, regardless of the type of business that you're building. So obviously we want to understand your cash. So how much are you burning? Um, how much do you have on hand? You know, what, what's, what's the cash basis of this company? Um, and then I'd say where we spend the majority of the time is income statement. So this is really giving us a lifeline into how is this company operating on a on a month to month basis? So we're looking at your bookings, which is your your new your new contracts that you've entered into. We're looking at your ARR, which is this recurring revenue of you know how many you sign a contract. Um, that contract's annual. That contract will will renew next year, or is a three year contract, and it's this much for for the first year. And that ARR is is something that's really important to to SaaS semesters. And I I have a little more detail on the next slide on that. And then it's, especially when you have different product lines, it's so important to make sure that you're able to convey to investors that you have a good sense of exactly what the revenue is from these products, because it shows that you're also able to understand how do you grow with each of these products, what the cogs are. So software investors particularly, we, we need to see those, those high margins and understanding the margins of a business is so important to investors because we want to see the high margins because that just means that you have more room to sell and to grow and to scale. And so that's why those cogs are super important and that gross margin by product is really important. And then obviously we need to understand, you know, what, what's your investment into R and D looking like? Is it, how does that, does it taper over time? Does it grow over time? What, what's your view? Um, how are you planning to invest in sales and marketing? And then, and then GNA is, is all else, but then Looking at kind of others, these are some metrics that investors are maybe doing calculations on the back end for themselves. Um, but magic number, pay um, payback in months, and and customer concentration, as well as LTV to CAC, these are all sales efficiency metrics that investors want to understand. You know, yes, you've invested in sales and marketing. How is that doing? You know, how are you are you spending too much on sales and marketing, and it's not reaping the results that you're looking for? Are you spending too little, and therefore you really like, that's what your fundraising is for to, to pump more, more cash into sales and marketing. So these are some metrics and, and you can Google kind of what the calculations for them are, but they're really important to under, for us to understand kind of that sales efficiency. Um, and then gross and net churn and gross and net retention. This is to help investors understand how exactly it, are customers performing here? You know, are they are they renewing every year? Are they growing their, their contract with the company? Um, and why? What's the reason? Um, are they, you know, is it are a lot churning, but they're replacing it with, with new companies and new customers? I think these are all things that we like to dig into. We obviously like to see like under 10% churn and net retention in the 120% plus, because that shows to us customers, this is sticky. Customers are staying on and, and buying more and more of the product, but they're also not going to a competitor or they're not, they're not re deciding that this is not an important um, investment for their own team. So these are some, some really important metrics that, that investors are always looking at. And then rule of 40 is just one to, to keep on the back of your mind, but this is something I think more for later stage companies. It's essentially, yes, you're spending a lot of cash, but is your growth um, meaning if you add your growth and your, your cash burn, you know, does that get you to over 40%? So will you grow over time? Is there, 
it gives us a way to understand like, is there a pathway to profitability here? Um, so this is another one that, that lots of investors are looking at. All right, and I think the next one is my last slide, so I will stop talking soon. Um, so because we are software investors, I really wanted to, to do a, a little bit of an overview on, on ARR. Um, this is primarily for software companies. I think it's also valuable for, um, for direct to consumer companies where, where they're more subscription based. So that's where this, this metric is, is more important, but we just wanna understand what's recurring versus what's one time. And that's what your ARR number is. Your ARR number is that recurring, just really um, stable revenue that you know you're going to get year on year on year. And so typically when you're building out an ARR, MRR is just the monthly version of it, MRR model, you want to understand, you know, here's what we started with. Here's how, how much our customers grew their contracts from existing customers. Here's how many reduced their contracts. Um, here's all the new customers we added. Here's all the customers we lost. And then that's what gets us to the ending MRR number. So you want to typically do this month by month. And then it gives you a really good view as to how the company is performing. So on a, on a top line basis. But one thing we do see is, is companies are adding in other things into, into ARR. So we definitely would exclude any services revenue. Even if those services are recurring, it's still not um, what we call like as high quality revenue. It's, it's definitely, we, we always exclude it from, from ARR. And then we also exclude kind of one time, any implementation fees or any other non-software revenue. I'd also, you know, there's, there's lots of schools of thought, but I personally also exclude pilots because unless you're able to show those pilots converting, um, then I would maybe include them. But pilots are a little bit tricky because they're not necessarily that annual contract. So you really want to keep your ARR or MR, the monthly version, to, to annual contracts. So this is like, you know that they're going to renew. Otherwise, if you do include pilots, which can be a little bit more fickle, um, I, it, can, it can mess up your, your churn and your retention numbers. All right, so I believe that is my last slide. Um, apology, that might have, I might have gone a, a little bit over what, what Aaron wanted me to, but I hope that was helpful and, and, and give, just gave a, a good overview of, of venture and, and the different types of funding and what to look out for out there and what investors are looking for. No, absolutely, Anki. Thank you for sharing those valuable insights. Um, don't even worry about going over. I think that the information you gave was very well put um, and easy to understand. And I am not an entrepreneur in that sense and going through this, but I was able to understand it, which is ideal, right? You want everyone to be able to um, absorb the information. So now we're going to open it up for a Q&A. We had some questions come through, so I'll start feeding those. For those of you that are um, in the audience, please change. make sure to change your thing to everyone so that way we can see all of your questions come through. So for your view, you can have everyone or the panelists, make sure it's to everybody. Uh, one of the questions we had was uh, from uh, GMA. So her question is, do lead investors, follow-on investors, and strategic investors sign on to the same terms in the same round? Yeah, so um, how rounds work is you have one round. So let's say it's your series A, which is you've decided to raise, making up a number because I feel like round sizes have completely changed in the last two years. So let's say um, for your business, it means that you wanna raise a $10 million or $20 million series A, right? Um, you're, you and your lead investor agree to that term sheet, which says, okay, this will be a $20 million fundraise. It will be at a $50 million valuation. And this is what the liquidation preferences are. This is, you know, here's all the other nuts and bolts. You sign that with your lead investor first. Um, you agree to that. And then typically you share that with all other investors that you've been talking to. And they sign on, they don't sign on to the term sheet. They sign on to the final docs. So a term sheet is less like signed, but more agreed upon. And then you, once you get that term sheet, you start updating all the legal documents. So this is your, your shareholder agreement, your purchase agreement, your articles of incorporation, everything, you know, your right of first refusal, your board resolution, et cetera. There's all these legal documents that obviously I would recommend working with a lawyer on this, which most investors will ask you to. Um, but there's all this set of documents that really lay out exactly what the, 
what the company now looks like because now you're you're changing the whole ownership structure of the company because you're adding more capital at a new price, et cetera. So then these follow-on and strategic investors, they sign on to those financing documents. Um, they don't sign on to the term sheet. That's typically how it how it works. But they do look to see the term sheet because it gives them an insight into the core aspects of what those financing docs will include. Very good. Thank you for okay. that. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I have is, uh, what is the engagement cycle for Salesforce when you're interested in a solution or an idea? Yeah, I mean, it depends. There's there's companies that we talk to for, you know, since their series seed, where they might be a little bit early for us, and we just build that relationship, see how we be helpful along the way. And then once they're starting to look for, you know, investors, we get re-engaged. And depending on, again, it's so bespoke to every company, but depending on how long it takes to find that lead investor, um, it could be anywhere from, you know, a month to six months. So it really, it really depends on the, on the timing that the company has or years sometimes, you know, we, we're in conversations with companies that have decided we can, we don't, we need, we have enough cash runway. We don't need another round of venture funding. So we'll wait another year before we, we raise capital again. Very good. Uh, Giselle had a few questions. So thank you, Giselle. Uh, one of them was, what is the minimum percentage of the deal that the lead takes? Ooh, um, we're not a lead investor. So I'm not, I, I can't, I'm sure there's lots of different schools of thought here. I mean, we typically see at least 20% is what I want to say. But it, it's a pretty hefty, it's a pretty hefty amount. Um, sometimes you have co-leads as well. So they might split the round between the two of them. Um, sometimes the lead investor will take 100% of the round too. So it really, it really depends on what that particular investor is looking for. And, and I think also like part of it is you pushing back on exactly how much do you want the lead investor to have. You start getting into kind of allocation discussion. So if there's other investors that you want to make sure to have on the cap table, because like I said, you want that that well-rounded cap table, um, you, the lead investor might have to take a little bit less so that they can accommodate having these additional investors on the, you know, entering the round. And that makes sense. Each partnership's different, right? Um, and depending on the investment. Um, and Giselle had another question. So how do these metrics soften, if at all, for an impact business? Yeah, it's a good one. Um, so I think you have different, I, I had a slide actually on, on impact investing, but um, there's different types, just like there's different types of traditional venture investors, there's also different types of impact investors out there. So our fund, you know, I speak for myself and, and our team, but we're really, we're look, we don't soften our metrics, right? We're still looking for that high growth. We're still looking for something similar to what a traditional institutional fund would look, like, would look at for, for terms of um, metrics. Then you have other funds that are more patient capital or more, um, I'd say like, concessionary and they're able to like their mandate is very different they look at companies that that have a longer runway to to exit right that that don't have that that super high growth which is which is traditional with investors or venture investors so there's lots of different different types of investors again that's why those conversations of exactly what type of investor are you what are you looking for and, and making sure that that those align is so critical to to the, to your own diligence on those investors no, absolutely. I liked that point you made about the different relationships and sort of deciding what kind of investment you want and who you want to work with, because that's a pretty long relationship, right? Yeah. Um, and then Tejas wanted us, wanted you to repeat what you said on the rule of 40, if you can for us. Yeah. So I definitely just, I mean, I would Google it versus um, just so you have it for your own edification, but this is really us understanding kind of how, like, how does this company get to profitability? Are they are they burning more than they're growing? In which case we'd have a lot of concerns, right? Because that just means your, your cash efficiency is, is not there. Um, you're burning way too much cash, but like it's not really resulting in, in much growth. And so that's why we, we really like to look at that, at that rule of 40 to make sure, okay, at least like if you net the two, they are growing above 40%. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at you know, public companies, I'd say these are, these are the ones where rule of 40 is really important. Um, because you see that they're they're typically around the 40 mark. Some some are lower, some are lower, some are higher. <laughs> but 40 is like a, a benchmark. Okay. Um, and then when partnering with Salesforce Ventures, what do we have access to? 
Yeah, um, great, great question. But you know, our it, it's such a bespoke model to each each company because each company is so different and, and has different needs. Um, typically, what we're working on is you know introducing our companies to advisors. We have like a whole host of experts in enterprise software and experts within lots of industries within Salesforce, and so those are some invaluable conversations to have. And then we're also you know. Again, bespoke, but depending on, on the goals of the company, we're making introductions to our product teams, we're making introductions to, to customers at times. So really is, is a conversation between, between us and that company and, and what their goals are and how we can best support them. But those are just, just a couple quick ones. All right. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions in the audience? This is your time. You have her undivided attention. <laughs> We'll give it another few seconds, see if anybody pops a question in there for you, Enki. Um, um, so we'll sort of move on. We'll see if some questions come in, we can filter them in. But um, I would love to, um, I'd love to know everybody's takeaways from today's event. So what's one action that you're gonna take to build investor relationships with Salesforce Ventures, or even just a general tech takeaway from all the resources and information that Enki shared with us. I'd love to see some of that in the chat, just to see that you guys have been engaged today and you were able to get something out of it. I know my key takeaways. So again, I had shared with you that I loved um, you sort of talking about the different type of investors and making sure it's the right investor for you with the right kind of relationship. Um, and also I loved how you mentioned grants. Um, it is free money. I think people forget that, right? And so it's such a great avenue of, of investment for entrepreneurs to consider. So thank you for sharing that um, and touching base on and reminding our entrepreneurs that they have that option. Um, Grants are, and, grants are just also, like I said, like they're just a, the, the historical way of doing grants where it was only for nonprofits is definitely changing now. Like it's, it's definitely changing in the last couple of years. So um, I definitely recommend checking, checking it out. Yeah. And there are so many different kinds and people, everybody's offering them. Right. Um, so it looks like sit Lolly. Um, it looks like she asked a question. So do you have some data on the split of women and men founders supported by your fund? Yeah, so um, I, I have the data only on the on the impact fund because that's where I sit. And actually, it's fresh off the presses because we just published it yesterday in our impact report. But our fund is sixty eight percent women or under underrepresented minorities in the U S. Um, for you know founder, co founder, or CEO. Very good. Right. And it looks like Chaitra really took away the type of investors in the deep dive on ARR and Giselle's very thankful. So she had some key takeaways about building that list of impact investors at family offices, as well as VC. And Teha says, it's interesting to note the role pilot revenue plays in ARR. Very good. I'm glad that you guys are getting some really great information out of this. So um, I love it. And thank you for sharing with us and taking full advantage of this opportunity to learn from Salesforce.